All right, we're in Luke Acts for beginners, lesson number 14, the ministry of Peter, Peter's first sermon. We're going to cover Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to Acts chapter 2, verse 47. So today we place Luke's first letter to Theophilus in the gospel section along with Matthew, Mark, and John because in this letter Luke describes you know, the birth, the life, the ministry, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. The book of Acts usually stands alone as a history book followed by the rest of the New Testament made up of letters or epistles. In the beginning, many times the book of Luke and the book of Acts were you know, together because Luke wrote both of them and they circulated together. This is why uh, I've chosen in this series to put them together. So we finished the uh, book of Luke and now we're going to begin the book of Acts. Uh, now the book of Acts is also a letter. It's the second letter written to a Gentile official of some kind named Theophilus. We learned that back in, in Luke. The first letter, Gospel of Luke, was written to give this man an organized presentation of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, which in effect preached the gospel to him. This second letter was prepared for the same person not long after the first letter was written, somewhere between 60 and 68 AD. In it, Luke describes the people and events that contribute to the establishment of the church, which took place on Pentecost Sunday. Now, we hear this word Pentecost a lot. Pentecost is the Greek word for the Hebrew word weeks. Let me give you a little timeline here so that we can see uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the order of events that take place of, of which uh, uh, Luke uh, writes about in the book of Acts. So following the Passover, if you look at the top, by the way, you have a Jewish timeline and then you have the same timeline but uh, with Christian uh, events that, that take place and we, we'll be able to compare the two here. So following the Passover, there was a period of seven days where no leaven was to be eaten or kept in the house. That seven days led to another Sabbath day or Saturday when this feast was over. Now on the next day, which was Sunday, the Jews celebrated the feast of first fruits where they brought in the first part of the spring harvest, usually barley, and made an offering to the Lord. We read about that in Leviticus chapter 23, 10 and 11. They did that before they themselves ate from the harvest. In other words, this was a first fruits. You know, the first harvest comes in, the first fruits go to the Lord. The next feast on the calendar was the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost in the Greek language, where the Jews counted seven weeks, seven Sabbaths, plus one day, 50 days, that's why they call it in the Greek Pentecost, Penta 50, okay, Pentecost, and they gave thanks for the much greater harvest that occurred at that time of the year, which would be late summer. Now if you notice at the bottom, um, the, um, uh, the graphic at the bottom, the same timeline but with Christian events. So uh, on the Thursday you have the Last Supper and the Garden of Gethsemane. On the Friday the uh, crucifixion and burial. Saturday the Sabbath. Sunday the resurrection. Then 40 days Jesus appears before His ascension. Uh, ten more days when He says to the apostles to wait for Him in Jerusalem. Ten more days go by. And then on the Sunday, Pentecost, the Feast of, uh, the feast of Weeks, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descends upon the apostles and the, um, the, uh, you know, they begin to preach the, uh, the gospel. So it's against this backdrop of Jewish yearly celebration in Jerusalem, Luke as always, always trying to pinpoint, right? Remember I said he's very interested in history. So he's trying to pinpoint you know, the time of year and the place and the festival during which time these things are taking place. And so the writer of Acts begins to instruct his audience of one concerning the establishment, growth, and spread of the Christian church throughout the Roman Empire. So let's take a look at an outline of the book. Very easy to outline the book of Acts, really two main sections. One section is the ministry of Peter. The next section is the ministry of Paul. So you have the ministry of Peter beginning in Acts 1 all the way to Acts 10 his first sermon, his post-Pentecost ministry, 
persecution of uh, Peter and the apostles, persecution of the church, one and two, and then Peter preaches to the uh, Gentiles. Then the second section, as I say, the ministry of Paul, chapters 13 to the end. Paul's first missionary journey, his second missionary journey, and third missionary journey, and then his one, two, three arrests, and then his final journey to Rome. As I say, the book is easy to outline because it contains the descriptions of these two apostles' ministries in narrative form. This is why it is called the Acts of the Apostles and not the Thoughts of the Apostles or the Theology of the Apostles. Uh, Luke is interested in recording what the apostles actually did in the establishment of the church. Now, there's teaching by Peter, of course, and there's teaching by Paul and others, Stephen, for example, in the book of Acts, but these sections are subordinate and they're in service to the actions of the apostles and other uh, early uh, church characters as they spread the gospel and planted the church against great odds in the pagan world of the first century. So Luke begins with Peter as he is the first to preach the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus to the Jews and converts to Judaism who have gathered in Jerusalem. And then later on, the first one to break down the wall between Jew and Gentile by bringing the gospel to non-Jews. So the story that Luke tells moves on seamlessly to describe the dynamic conversion of the most unlikely apostle, Saul of Tarsus, who was a Jewish Pharisee bent on destroying this wayward sect of Judaism that worshiped Jesus as the divine Messiah. Because at the beginning, Christianity was simply seen as a sect, you know, a branch of Judaism. And as far as Saul of, Tarsus, uh, Saul of Tarsus was concerned, it was a branch, it was a sect that needed to be wiped out because it was dangerous, it was blasphemous, it was against the scriptures. So Luke uses up the rest of his book detailing the incredible ministry of Saul, uh, who then becomes Paul the Apostle, as he takes the gospel beyond Judea and Samaria to every corner of the Roman Empire and beyond. So let's begin with uh, Peter at the very beginning, Acts chapter one. Look at his uh, sermon. So Luke uh, begins, he says, the first account I composed Theophilus, and we'll just stop there. Interesting right away to note something. Note in verse one where Luke refers to his reader by his name, Theophilus, and not his title, most excellent Theophilus, as he had done in, you know, in the book of Luke. This suggests that this man had been converted since the writing of Luke's first letter. You know, it would have been highly improper to do so in that society. Now, in that society, just to, just to call a high official by his first name would have been improper. So in the same way, it would have been unusual for Luke to use a title when addressing a brother in Christ, because uh, these things were set aside when Christians were talking to one another. And so for this reason, uh, we think that Theophilus had been converted you know, in between the two letters there, he became a Christian. So let's keep reading. It says about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So here Luke summarizes Jesus' life and ministry with just a few words, and he focuses on events that took place between his resurrection and his ascension. And he mentions things like his dynamic appearances during a 40 day period, his teachings concerning the kingdom, his instructions to the apostles to remain in Jerusalem and not to return home to Galilee as they had done after his crucifixion. And he promises that they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit in the near future. Now, there, there, there's often confusion about the nature of what Jesus is referring to here. So let us briefly review the topic of the baptism of the Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit. 
Um, let's begin by establishing and reviewing some terms that will help us understand uh, uh, this idea of baptism with the Holy Spirit. First term I want to mention is the term empower. Empower. This is where the Holy Spirit enables or empowers someone to perform something, to do something. For example, to perform great and complex tasks. We read in uh, Exodus 31 verses 1 to 5, we read the following. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all kinds of craftsmanship, to make artistic designs for work in gold and silver and in bronze, and in the cutting of stones for settings, and in the carving of wood, that he may work in all kinds of craftsmanship. So here, the Holy Spirit is enabling someone to perform great and complex tasks. So uh, in this case, it would be uh, craftsmanship necessary to uh, uh, build the uh, tabernacle in the desert. Or the Holy Spirit can empower someone to perform miracles, like Moses, for example. Or the Holy Spirit empowers someone to see visions or to speak from God. Another example of this, 2 Chronicles. Now the Spirit of God came on Azariah. There's the Spirit of God coming on Azariah, the son of Oded. And he went out to meet Asa and said to him, listen to me Asa and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you when you are with him and if you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. So in this case, the Spirit of the Lord came on Azariah, and what did he do? He prophesied, he spoke in the name of the Lord. Another example, in Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring the good news to the afflicted. So you have another um, uh, prophet saying, the Spirit of God is on him. And what does the Spirit empower him to do? It empowers him to bring the news, in other words, to speak on behalf of God. Or the Holy Spirit empowers someone for leadership. Again, in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 16. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, this is David, in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward, and Samuel arose and went to Ramah. So in this case, uh, the Spirit is empowering David to be a leader to be king and all the skills uh, and knowledge that he would uh, need in order to carry out that task. So the Bible refers to this empowering work of the Holy Spirit in different ways. For example, it'll say, uh, um, uh, filled him with the Spirit, as we read in Exodus 30, uh, uh, 31, 5. Well, what did that mean, filled him with the Spirit? Well, it meant empowered this man to do certain uh, work, certain crafting uh, work as a, as a, as a craftsman. Um, um, uh, for Moses, uh, the Bible says, you'll perform all the miracles I have given you the power to do. Well, there is empowering. Empowering for whom? For Moses. To do what? To do miracles. Uh, in other places in the Old Testament, uh, the Spirit of God came upon. That's one way of saying that the Spirit of God empowered Azariah. The Spirit of the Lord came upon David. Again, another way of saying that the Spirit of God empowered David to do certain things. So this empowering was given to only certain ones for a time to enable them to carry out a task or a mission from God. Um, Samson, for example, was empowered by God with what? With great strength, but he lost it, didn't he? Because of sin. And David, even David asks God not to remove the spirit from him in uh, Psalm 51, uh, 11. So the spirit empowered some people to do certain tasks in the Old Testament, but it was temporary. In other words, it was only certain people and it was only for a certain amount of time, okay? 
Now, the great promise of the Old Testament was that when the Messiah would come, He would usher in a time when all of God's people would have a portion of the Holy Spirit, not only a few like the prophets and the judges and the kings. This is where um, uh, Joel's uh, prophecy comes in. Uh, Joel writes, it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind and your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. And so here Joel is talking about the time in the future when the Messiah would come and some of the things that would accompany the coming, the coming of the Messiah. And so the promise of the Spirit was going to be different somehow. Everyone would have it, not just a few. Both men and women, as well as old and young, would know and speak God's word and see the vision of heaven described there, not just the prophets. The Spirit would always be with, with, with you. He even says slaves and servants, they would have, you know, from the lowest to the highest, men, women, everyone would have the Spirit. So this measure of the Spirit that he's talking about would not be empowerment, it would be called indwelling. Okay? So you have two. You have empowerment, the ability to do certain things, and you have indwelling. Indwelling, for indwelling, the Holy Spirit is living within the believer, not simply enabling him to do or see or say something in service to God, but existing within a person in order to transform that individual into the image of Christ. So empowering enabled certain people to do great things and the Old Testament is filled with stories of what these people did in service to God. Moses and Joshua and David and the prophets as well as a few apostles and individuals in the early church for a short time, all were empowered with the ability to do certain things by God. Indwelling, on the other hand, enabled people to become Christ-like, to become living sacrifices, to become eternal beings, Paul describes in detail what the indwelling spirit does for the Christian. And if you, you know, want to read that, read Romans chapter eight and you'll see all the things that the indwelling spirit does for the Christian. Now, the term indwelling is also referred to in different ways, or actually the, um, you know, the gift of indwelling is also referred to in different ways. For example, Receive the Holy Spirit. There's a term that is referring to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. For example, in John chapter 20, verse 22, Jesus is giving the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to His apostles, it says, and when He, that means Jesus, and when He had said this, He breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So what did they, what did they get there, empowering? Well, it couldn't be empowering because they could not yet speak in tongues. This ability only came on Pentecost Sunday. No, what they received here was the indwelling. In verse, uh, another passage uh, of uh, scripture, another term rather, is receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Again, it's a different term, but it's referring to the same thing, this time referring to the indwelling. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, which we'll read a little later on, but I want to refer to it now. Peter said to them, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what, what did they get here, these people? You know, what did they get? It can't be empowering because none of the, you know, the 3,000 people who were baptized on that day exhibited any miraculous powers. So the confusion between the two occurs because at times the Bible uses the same term when referring to both empowering or indwelling. 
and only the context in which the term is used dictates the meaning. And so that term, you know, baptized with the Holy Spirit, this brings us back to Acts chapter 1, verse 5. Remember, we, we just read that a little while ago. Jesus is talking to His apostles. He says, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay, the question is, which baptism is that? <laughs> now, when John the Baptist used the term prophesying what Jesus as the Messiah would bring, it meant indwelling. He would give the Spirit to all who would believe in Him. And we read that in Acts you know, 2.38, remember? If you repent and you are baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, you'll receive what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what John promised. John said, you know, when He comes, He'll baptize you with the Spirit. When Jesus comes, what will He give you? He'll give you the indwelling. But in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus uses the same term, but He uses it in, re in reference to what would happen to the apostles. He's referring to the empowerment, to preach, to speak in tongues, to do great miracles, to raise the dead, to plant and grow the church against great persecution. It doesn't mean indwelling because He's already given them this in John chapter 20, verse 22. I know this seems a little confusing here, but try to keep these two definitions in mind as we go on because it'll help us understand passages in Acts that deal with the Holy Spirit. We just need to remember uh, uh, indwelling, empowering. Indwelling is the ability, you know, the, the Spirit dwelling in us, giving us the ability to become Christ-like, to raise us from the dead. Empowerment is the ability to do miracles or to do works or certain types of service in the name of the Lord. And, and, and the Bible, you know, Luke, uh, uses the same term to refer to both of these. So you, you have to kind of look at the context to figure out which one he's referring to. All right, let's keep that in mind. All right, let's keep going forward. Back to Acts chapter one, this time beginning in verse six. It says, so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. See, he's talking about the Holy Spirit coming upon them. And he says, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. So here their question about the restoration of the kingdom shows that they're still under the false notion of some kind of glorious restoration of the Jewish state and their place in it. And Jesus doesn't even bother to point out their error. Instead, He does two other things. Number one, He states that the knowledge of when the end of the Jewish kingdom and the end of the world, for that matter, is beyond man's grasp. Only God knows when these things are going to happen, so stop speculating. It's as if he said, yeah, I hear you, but you know, let's not even, I don't even want to talk about that. You know, the Father knows when these things are, are going to take place. You don't need to worry yourself about that. And then two, he outlines and reviews their mission. First, he says, they will receive, what? When the, when the Spirit comes upon them, what will they be getting? Indwelling or empowering? Well, empowering. They will receive empowering when the Spirit comes upon them. And this empowering will enable them to be witnesses to what they have seen uh, to the world, beginning in Jerusalem. So Luke repeats the description of Jesus' uh, ascension, this time adding the information about the angels who prophecy concerning His return. All right, we move on to uh, uh, verse 12 to 26, not going to read that. Uh, Luke provides a, an intimate look at the activity that took place among the apostles and disciples between the time of Jesus' ascension and the descent of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost Sunday. A couple of things that take place. Number one, it says the apostles, uh, the 11 of them, gathered with the women who had supported and followed Jesus, Mary his mother along with his brothers to begin devoting themselves to prayer and waiting. 
Secondly, Peter takes the lead by putting into context the actions and the death of Judas, right? I mean, it could have been a doubt here, a point of discouragement. The apostles could have been saying to themselves, well, you know, what happened to Judas? Did we fail him? Did Jesus fail him? And Peter reassures them, no, no, you know, this was according to scripture. What he did and how he ended served God's purpose. And these things were spoken of by the prophets. It was not a failure on their part or on Jesus' mission. This was something that uh, you know, God had uh, said would, uh, would take place, and it did. And then thirdly, through prayer, they put forward two qualified men who had been faithful disciples from Jesus' baptism to the ascension uh, in order to replace Judas. And in the end, uh, Matthias is chosen to be one of the 12. And so that brings us to the day of Pentecost, beginning in Acts chapter two. So let's read uh, Acts chapter two, the first uh, couple of verses, all the way to verse uh, eight. It says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Whoa, I want to stop there. Filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking with other tongues. There's the empowerment and there's the witness of the empowerment. Okay? So they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, why are not, the, uh, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? So they were filled with the Holy Spirit, meaning that they received empowerment. And the visible signs of this were the tongues of fire appearing over their heads and the sudden empowerment to speak languages that were previously unknown to them. I mean, they were from Galilee and they spoke Aramaic in their daily lives, Hebrew in their you know, religious practices, but did not know any other languages. So Pentecost, you know, it, it was an important feast for all Jews and proselytes to Judaism from all over the world uh, would come to Jerusalem for this event. So Luke uh, 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 records over a dozen language groups gathered and each heard the apostles speaking in their own native language. Now I mention this because there is the effort by charismatic groups to claim that they have reproduced this miracle in the modern age. However, the sounds that they make, which they claim are tongues, are unintelligible. And, and, and make no sense. And their response to this is that, uh, well, only God actually understands them or they're speaking in the tongues of angels. But in my experience in reading through the Bible, every time angels are speaking to men, they use human languages that, that men understand. This, of course, is contrary, you know, this, this claim of, of having reproduced this miracle in the modern era, this is contrary to the grammar and to the context of the passage. For example, the grammar, when they say they began speaking in other tongues, the Greek word there is glossa, the tongue, by extension, a language, a human language. There's the specific word for human language. They began speaking in other human languages. So grammatically, you know, the, 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 the claim that they have reproduced what was, in, you know, what was at Pentecost is, is uh, incorrect because the Bible says what the apostles were doing were actually speaking in human languages that they had not themselves learned. And the context also. In verse eight, the crowd says that they heard the apostles speak in their own language and Luke names, as I mentioned before, over a dozen languages that were used. And so the apostles receive empowerment and that power is seen, tongues of fire, and heard Jewish men miraculously preaching in languages that they did not know. 
and this phenomenon done in fulfillment of a prophecy concerning the time when the Messiah would come. Um, in um, 1 Corinthians 14, Paul quotes this. It says, in the law is written by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers I will speak to this people and even so they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So uh, Old Testament prophecy pointed to this phenomenon taking, taking place. So Peter's sermon, begins um, here in Acts uh, 2.13. Uh, people are uh, noticing what's going on and uh, Luke writes, but others were mocking and saying, they're full of sweet wine. So Luke sets the stage for Peter's first sermon by recounting some people's reaction to the miracle they had just witnessed. You know, all oh, the apostles are drunk. So Peter draws the crowd's attention by answering this charge with his powerful Pentecost sermon. And this sermon can be broken down into three sections. It's rather long, so we'll just read parts of it, but three sections, all right? First section is the witness of the Holy Spirit. The witness of the Holy Spirit. Peter begins his sermon by crediting the Spirit of God for the miracle of tongues that they have just witnessed and explaining that this is the phenomenon that would accompany the coming of the Messiah according to the prophets. And he quotes the prophet, uh, the prophet Joel, chapter two, uh, to make his point. And we read, right, we read that prophecy a little while back about uh, 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 everyone would have the Spirit, everyone would, you know, everyone would display the Spirit, the Spirit be given to everyone. He's saying what's taking place now is, a, is the fulfillment of that prophecy in the book of Joel. Next, the witness of the gospel itself. And here I would want to read just a, a small portion of this. He says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. So Peter proclaims the simple facts of the gospel message. Jesus, proven to be God's anointed one, meaning Messiah, through miracles and wonders and signs. Jesus, crucified unjustly by sinful men, all done according to God's knowledge and plan. Jesus, resurrected by God according to prophecy about Him, and here Peter quotes David, Psalm 16, verses eight to 11, to make his point that all of this was according to God's will and foretold by the prophets. Remember, it's Jews that are, that are listening to this, uh, to this uh, sermon. And to appeal to Jews, you have to appeal to scripture. Okay? So that's what Peter is doing. He's saying everything that has taken place in Jesus' ministry, his life, his death, even his resurrection, all of it according to what the prophets, according to what the, the word of God said about this particular matter. So let's read um, a little further down on his uh, lesson, the climax of his lesson. He says, brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried and his tomb is uh, with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades or, nor did his flesh um, suffer decay. This Jesus, God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who was ascended into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So Peter fortifies his gospel method, message with a deeper explanation concerning the resurrection, for this was a new element. I mean, they understood the idea of substitutionary death as atonement for sin. I mean, you know, they had killed a million 
plus animals throughout their history in sacrifice uh, to, to, to bring home the lesson that you know, uh, uh, sin causes death and a death is required to atone for sin. So they understood that idea. Somebody had to die for sin. However, the idea, not to mention the possibility of res uh, resurrection, this was something new. After all, none of the animals that they had sacrificed over the centuries ever came back to life. So Peter explains, uh, in mentioning David here, Peter explains that David prophesied about this very event, the resurrection, and he corrects their understanding of these passages where the Jews thought that David was referring to himself, but in reality, he was referring to Jesus. So in Psalm 6, 8 to 11, where David speaks to the promise of his resurrection, Peter says, uh, uh, this actually points to Christ, who will make David's resurrection possible with his own. You know, David has written, you will not allow my, 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 you know, my, my body to, to my flesh to decay. You, know, you, won't, you, you won't permit me to remain in the grave. So everybody was thinking, oh, David's going to resurrect. Well, no. Peter corrects that idea. He says the reason that David had hope that his body would not decay in the grave was that Jesus would resurrect and make possible David's resurrection. That's how he connects those two ideas. And then in Psalm 110, 11, which Jews saw as a promise God made to David concerning his reign and power over his enemies, you know, my Lord, you know, uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Jesus himself corrected them of this idea when he asked the Pharisees a question about this passage that they couldn't answer. You know, if David calls him Lord, how is he his son? Matthew 22, 45. Peter provides the answer in the passage. Uh, he provides the answer. He says, in this passage, the father is talking uh, to the son, not David. He's talking to the son, Jesus. And so God said to Jesus, sit at my right hand, which represents power, and I will make your enemies your footstool. You will win over the devil and death and unbelieving Jews through your resurrection. So he summarizes his argument with a damning conclusion. He says, this Jesus, anointed by God, spoken of by the prophets, witnessed by miracles, seen resurrected by us, ascended to heaven and who has now sent the Holy Spirit to do what you have heard and seen in us today. This person has been declared Lord and Christ by God. Oh, and by the way, you killed him. You're responsible for his death. And so let's keep reading what happens. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What are they going to be getting here? Well, we'll see in a minute, okay? It says, for this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to Himself. And with many other words, He solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received His word were baptized, and on that day there were added about 3,000 souls. So those who accept or believe the witness of the Spirit and the message of the gospel, they respond. And Peter, according to the instructions given him and the other apostles, what instructions? Well, uh, back in Matthew 28, Jesus came up and said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. To do what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in Mark 16, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. So Peter, according to the instructions given to him and the other apostles by Jesus, which we read, Matthew 28, Mark 16, they tell the crowd 
how they are to obey the gospel. They express their faith in Jesus as Lord and Christ by repenting of their sins and being baptized. The word baptized means to immerse, being immersed in water. Someone says, well, where is, there, where is the water? They're not near the Jordan here, river. Well, there was the pool of Siloam nearby in the temple uh, complex, as well as a, a large water basin near the pilgrim gate. When I say a basin, I don't mean a basin you can carry, like a pool if you wish, where the pilgrims would clean themselves and purify themselves before they would enter the holy city of Jerusalem. So plenty of water around. Peter teaches that at their baptism, these people would receive both the forgiveness of their sins and remember, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, okay, what are they getting? Indwelling or empowerment, which one? Well, they're getting indwelling. How do we know? because none of the 3,000 displayed any miraculous gifts. And there are always miraculous gifts that accompany uh, the individual who is empowered by God. And you'll see as we work our way through Acts, others receive the Spirit and you know, we see cases of empowerment, if you wish. So it's good that we know the difference between what's going on, empowerment or indwelling. So 3,000 are baptized by the 12 on that day. And since that day, we continue to preach the same gospel with the same instructions to those who believe. And, um, and uh, those who believe and repent are immersed in Jesus' name for forgiveness of sins. And what do they receive today? They receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at that moment. Okay, so I said three sections in um, Peter's sermon, witness of the Holy Spirit, witness of the gospel, then finally witness of the church. So let's keep reading. They were continually, they meaning the people who had just been baptized, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Notice here, it didn't say many signs and wonders were taking place at the hands of the 3,000 that were baptized. No, 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 it was taking place at the hands of the apostles. Why? They received the empowerment, not the other 3,000. Let's keep reading. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone would have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. So Luke summarizes the early activity, the organization and the enthusiasm of the first Christian church located in Jerusalem. Note carefully the outline of an inspired biblical pattern laid out for church ministry, organization and growth in these few lines of scripture. Now, if you look carefully, you will note five different ministry areas begin and develop, as well as the relationship between ministry and church growth just in this passage. And very quickly, I will show them to you. Five biblical ministries. So we begin with evangelism. They were preaching the gospel to the lost and they were baptizing the repentant believers. That's the essence of the evangelism ministry. Next, the education ministry. It says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. And what did Jesus say to the apostles? Teach them to obey all things that I have commanded you. Okay, so, so that's the ministry of teaching, teaching God's word. Number three, fellowship. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, comma, fellowship, fellowship. They were in integrating these new Christians into the body of Christ. That's fellowship. Number four, worship. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. That's worship. They were organizing the church for Christian worship, taking the Lord's Supper. And number five, service. The church began to pool its resources in order to take care, for, uh, take, uh, to care rather for the needs of the brethren and the needs of the community. And there you have it. Those are the five biblical ministries. 
Anything you do in church work fits within one of these uh, ministry areas. Now Luke doesn't provide details on how all of this was done, only a brief overall sketch of the early church's five areas of ministry. In the final verse of this section, the inspired writer reveals the biblical approach to church growth. Look at this. It says, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So when you take the entire section together, you see that when the church is active in preaching to the lost, teaching the saved, practicing fellowship and worship and service, while the church is doing these things, Jesus adds to His body, the church. In other words, when the church ministers, the Lord adds to its numbers. All right, a couple of lessons that, uh, you know, that, that come from this introductory material here, a couple of lessons that we can draw. First lesson, I would suggest that we pray while we wait. You know, the apostles remained in prayer while they waited for the Spirit, and this kept them focused and ready uh, for the time that they would be empowered. Waiting on the Lord is not a passive thing. We need to be doing positive, productive type of waiting. And this kind of waiting needs to be accompanied by prayer and worship and service to keep us focused, to keep us from foolish complaining or giving up prematurely. Lesson number two, some people just don't get it and some people just don't want to get it. I mean, 3,000 were baptized on Pentecost Sunday, but there were more than 3,000 people who were actually there. And so in the face of disbelief and rejection from people who understand the gospel, but who just don't care, do what Peter did. It says here, he kept on exhorting them, verse 40. So keep proclaiming the message, keep telling the message. Somebody will eventually respond. And then lesson number three, Focus on ministry, not growth. Our task is to minister in the five areas of ministry and learn how to do these more effectively and how to keep these ministries operating simultaneously. Jesus is the one who will add to the church. Now, if you're interested in church growth uh, development, understand that more effective ministry equals more growth. The more effective that we minister, the more growth that we will uh, experience. Um, I do have another series and a book on this uh, topic of growth called Unlimited Growth. And if you're interested, you can just go to the BibleTalk.tv website and just type in Unlimited Growth and you'll get all the information uh, that you need on that particular, on that particular uh, topic. Okay, so that's our first lesson. Quite a bit of material to cover. Well, Acts is a lot of material to cover, so we, uh, we need to compress a lot of it. Uh, the next um, uh, reading assignment is Acts chapter 3, 1 to Acts 4, 37. I encourage you to read ahead. That way our lessons will make a lot more sense to you because you'll have read the material and know what we're talking about, even if I don't read the passages uh, during the lesson time. All right, thank you very much. We'll see you next time.